Good morning, everyone. This is Greg Davidson with RHSC. I'm pleased to have you all join us for this webinar today. Uh, without further ado, I'll kick it off to Ellen and we can get this started. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Greg. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, I'm really excited about today's webinar. Um, it is part of uh, uh, the launch of our new visibility and analytics work stream um, for the system strengthening working group. Uh, and so this work stream, um, you know, was an idea that came out of the, uh, the strategy rethink, which we discussed at our meeting in Nepal in March and then on our phone call in June. Um, and so, um, for those of you interested uh, in this topic and continuing to be involved, look for a survey that will be uh, coming out in the next couple of days that will have um, so that will help us gather, you know, specific topics in the area of visibility and analytics that um, that you would like to hear about, uh, and then we'll be following up with a call later um, in the month of August. So, um, so that's, uh, that's the idea, but today um, we'll be, uh, we're pleased to have our colleagues from the Global Health Supply Chain Procurement Supply Management Project. Um, they'll be talking about their Supply Chain Information System Maturity Model, or the SCISMM, which is a very long acronym, um, but I expect it to come tripping off everyone's tongue by the time uh, we're done with this webinar. Uh, so this model serves as a rapid assessment tool to meet the needs of countries and technical assistance providers in assessing maturity levels of information systems supporting public health supply chain. And so, uh, so uh, the format for today will have an hour and a half. Uh, we have actually an hour and a half because we really wanted to give um, give you techies out there a, a good deep dive into the tool. Um, so it, it'll be roughly 45 to 50 minutes of presentation, and then we'll have time for Q and A at the end. Um, you can uh, input your questions if you see on the uh, toolbar on the right hand side under questions. If you enter them there um, at any point, we um, will be sure to to ask them uh, when we get the opportunity. So I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, introduce our speakers for today. Um, Swarup Jai Prakash is a senior managing consultant with IBM's Global Business Services, and he works on the GHSC PSM project as an MI MIS solution architect um, responsible for the design, implementation, and oversight of various management information systems across the PSM organization. Um, he's been very much the man behind the scenes for the Global Family Planning Visibility and Analytics Network. Um, we've relied on him um, to help us uh, uh, handle all the, the technical solution for feeding our data into the, into the van. Um, along with various other projects, including this one that he's speaking about today. Swarup has over 18 years of experience in supply chain management in IT, uh, designing and developing enterprise solutions for customers in various sectors. Uh, then we'll also have Joe Schaub, um, who's been leading supply chain management projects for over 25 years. Um, he's a leading architect of advanced supply chain solutions across numerous industries, including healthcare, uh, and has been working with us as well on the PSM project. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Swarup to take us forward. Thanks, Helen. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today, uh, and thanks uh, to RHSC for giving us the opportunity to share regarding this uh, model. Um, so today we will talk about the model and also walk you through one example where we use this model. Uh, Joe, my colleague, will be talking about uh, Nepal example in a little bit. Uh, but before jumping into the model, I wanted to set some context as to how we approached uh, developing this model. Um, as, as the title says, it is a supply chain information systems maturity model. So we wanted to look at the overall supply chain 
and uh, the various functions and processes within the supply chain and uh, how uh, they, these different systems uh, address the different functions of supply chain. And so we started by really understanding our context of the supply chain, especially the public health sectors supply chain. So um, I, I want to start today's presentation with setting that context of looking at our uh, supply chain and some of the complexities that we have. Typically, uh, supply chain you know, has included several functions and those functions help um, deliver physical commodities from origin, it could be supplier, distributor, or manufacturer, all the way till our end consumers. And in our case, it could be patients, health facilities, clinics. Um, where today's, especially the public health supply chain becomes complex is um, given the different stakeholders that we have. So what that means is the supply chain that we operate in, there could be multiple um, donors, multiple entities procuring commodities for the same uh, set of patients or end consumers. Uh, we could have, for example, in, within the country, you could have a central medical store, you could have uh, downstream supply chain entities like district pharmacies or health clinics. And sometimes, even though they, they procure mostly from central medical stores, at times they might do their own procurements. So that creates parallel supply chains. In addition to that, you could have multiple programs. So for example, you could have an HIV uh, program that has its own supply chain versus malaria or reproductive health or family planning that has its own supply chain uh, operating. In addition to that, you have different or diverse supply chain partners. You have freight forwarders, you have distributors, you have manufacturers, you also have procurement agencies. So all these, when you look at um, the, the various functions that happen within the supply chain, and when you put all these different supply chain partners and players into play, you can understand the, the, the kind of complexity that um, we have to deal with. What that means is if we need to gain visibility across all these different operations being managed by these different players, it requires a lot of coordination. It requires that all these processes are orchestrated in a, in a seamless way. Um, so, so that's that's our that's that's the observation that we have had dealing with different countries and different supply chains within the, those countries. So, when we started looking at that, we realized that what is important is not to look at a supply chain function or, or even a particular supply chain in a siloed way, but more in a holistic and an overarching way. So how do we address these complexities? So let's, let's start looking at it, um, the way we have been doing, we have been addressing these supply chain complexities. Uh, so we looked at a couple of uh, countries when we were developing this. Uh, particularly, we were working with Nepal initially as this tool was evolving. Um, and our observation was that uh, typically what happens is when, when, when we start addressing supply chain challenges or complexities, we start by looking at a particular area. It could be warehousing, it could be logistics, uh, whatever you might call it. At times, you are so focused that it uh, misses the impact that what you are doing has on other areas of the supply chain. For example, what the, the system that you develop or the processes that you define for warehousing, even though it has a huge impact on planning or procurement, we may not necessarily consider those impacts um, right when we are designing or defining that process and system. Another challenge we saw was that um, we tend to focus on a particular supply chain level. For example, we look at central medical store and we start by that and, and, and then we lose sight of the other entities or other players within the supply chain, including manufacturers, procurement agencies, different donors, or even downstream uh, supply chain uh, entities like 
uh, community health workers, district pharmacies, and clinics. Um, similarly, there are multiple programs and initiatives, and as well as multiple donors. So each may take its own approach to dealing with these complexities. And at times, they may not all be aligned. That's another uh, challenge with our existing approach that we have seen. So what we said when we were uh, developing or designing this model, when we looked at these complexities and when we looked at how their approach was, we need to look at them um, not in a siloed fashion, but more in an overarching uh, holistic fashion so that when we, we, so that we understand all the various functions of the supply chain, as well as all the various uh, supply chains and diverse partners that operate in that supply chain. So data should be transformed from one level to another level, the same way that the physical commodities moves from one level to another. And what that means is um, you have a much more coordinated process and that ensures that physical commodities move from one point to another smoothly. But at the same time, the data associated with those commodities also move in tandem. So the data that you're getting is not based on reporting or after the fact, but it's more real time, which means that it helps you take supply chain decisions in a more effective way. So let's look at what, uh, based on all these uh, observations and understanding the complexities and, and how we need to redefine our approach to supply chain complexities, we started looking at information systems from there. So what really should supply chain information systems mean? So SCIS in short should be the foundational system that not only helps move your physical commodities from one point to another, from your, from your manufacturer all the way to end consumers, but it also should ensure that the data associated with those commodities also move in, in line with those uh, commodity movements so that the data that you get, the information that you get based on that physical movement helps with your strategic planning, helps with your tactical decisions, but also helps with your operational um, activities. For example, if the warehouse that is expecting a commodity from a manufacturer knows that this is the day that they can expect the commodity at their dock, they can plan their processes better, they can plan the warehouse space better, they can also cater to um, any shortages or stockouts that may be ex that they may be expecting, or they can plan procurements better. So an effective supply chain information system should really help improve your efficiencies, and it should do that by reducing a lot of manual work, reducing uh, inefficiencies like lead times or uh, stockouts, by providing data that is really real time, and uh, that helps take better supply chain decisions. And ultimately it should help us consistently deliver the right set of products to the right set of patients at the right time. Uh, that, so that's at a high level, that's really what we said supply chain information should be doing. So let's look at why it's really important to look at it from an overarching way and, and, and in a way that it's, um, it's uh, that we are taking a holistic view of supply chain information systems rather than looking at it in a siloed way. As you can see from this visual here, uh, you can categorize supply chain functions into various categories based on uh, some of the similarities that they have. For example, you could have procurement related processes, you could have forecasting and planning related processes, you have uh, warehousing related processes, when you look at the systems that address these specific supply chain processes, what happens in one area significantly uh, derives from what happens in another area. For example, how you plan your supply and how you uh, anticipate demand impacts your procurement processes and policies. And what you're procure procuring impacts uh, how you manage your suppliers and contracts. Similarly, what you do with procurement impacts warehousing and what you have in the warehouse impacts your plans. So it's, it's like a, a, a 
an intertwined set of processes that needs to be look at, looked at from a very holistic way. And uh, what it takes is to have a coordinated execution of these supply chain processes so that uh, information along with uh, physical commodities is moving from one process to another, from one system that addresses these processes to another. So as we, um, as we started designing a model that looked at all these various functions uh, and how uh, we can categorize them uh, to define maturities across these functions, uh, we wanted to define the functionalities itself uh, at a high level so that we categorize them based on industry best practices. So we didn't want to reinvent the wheel in defining supply chain information system functionalities. Uh, instead, we looked at some of the industry best practices like supply chain operations reference model and uh, APQC, which is American Productivity and Quality Control Process Classification Frameworks. So uh, SCORE, even though it's more manufacturing oriented, it gave uh, us an ability to look at processes in a very uh, logical and a categorized way. So for example, it says uh, SCORE typically has processes around planning, sourcing, making, which is related to manufacturing, deliver and return. So manufacturing, which, is, which relates to make in the SCORE model doesn't really, um, isn't really something that we manage in our supply chain. So we kind of tailored that to our uh, needs to make it more um, relatable to our context. And APQC process classification framework provides processes by different industries. So Joe, my colleague, uh, looked at it extensively and uh, derived a lot of uh, processes that are specific to our sector. And we kind of made it uh, contextual to how we operate. So we looked at a couple of examples. And, and one thing I'd like to reiterate at this point is this is a model that we have developed looking at a couple of countries, but it's it's still an evolving process. So we're taking a lot of feedback. In fact, we would like feedback from uh, folks like you to see if we, how we can make it more useful. So we looked at these uh, frameworks and standard uh, models, and then used those to arrive at uh, basic supply chain information system functionalities. And then using those functionalities, we uh, set them into four different uh, maturity levels, which I'll be talking about in, in a little while. So based on those uh, models and frameworks, we organize those supply chain information system capabilities uh, and functionalities. And in addition to that, in subsequent iterations, what we did was we also looked at not only the functional areas, but also the technical areas. Uh, and we still, are getting feedback to add more um, capabilities and areas. For example, an analytics is one thing which we've been hearing people uh, ask us to add. But uh, as you can see, the ones highlighted here in green, those are more technical and uh, cross-cutting capabilities. For example, master data management. Um, what master data you manage in terms of product or facilities or even suppliers, impacts all the other functional areas of your supply chain. Uh, interoperability is again technology oriented, oriented uh, capabilities, but it impacts all your other supply chain uh, functionalities. Similarly, track and trace. So this just gives you an idea of how we ultimately organized these supply chain information system capabilities uh, to further define them across multiple models to understand how these systems could mature. So before I jump into the model itself, uh, just to summarize how the way we started looking at supply chain information system differs from existing approaches, just to um, look at them across these uh, five parameters. So in terms of process, the existing, existing systems and approaches that we saw tend to capture uh, transactions or uh, data after the fact. Um, 
Whereas from supply chain information systems perspective, what we wanted was systems driving those transactions. That means that uh, all your transactions are, as they happen, the data associated with those transactions get captured real time. So for example, if, this, if the manufacturer ships immediately, uh, the warehouse or facilities downstream know that something has shipped. As warehouses receive those commodities immediately, upstream systems or processes related to planning know that uh, we have so much stock in our system. Uh, so what that does is it improves your visibility. You get real-time data visibility as opposed to uh, a reporting approach where you see data only after the fact, maybe a, week, a few weeks later or a month later. Uh, and what it also means is that it eliminates in, in a reporting kind of an approach, people have to enter data after the fact, and that's usually a manual data entry. So this eliminates that approach, and a lot of these processes should be driven by system um, capturing that data, and uh, so your data integrity and quality improves significantly. And when you have a higher uh, quality of data and uh, obtaining that data on real-time basis, your ability to take effective decision improves. Um, and overall, all these systems, as they start talking to each other, for example, your planning systems talking to warehousing and warehousing systems talking to procurement, for example, will improve the flow of information uh, in a smooth way. So interoperability is also an essential uh, feature of this uh, approach. So let me move into the model itself. Um, so we took this organization of supply chain information systems uh, and we determined different sub uh, capabilities within those processes and functions. And then we categorized them across four different levels. Um, so let me jump into the spreadsheet at this point. So this spreadsheet, just to give introduce uh, the spreadsheet, uh, we have um, an instruction page to begin with in the first tab. It highlights how this sheet can be used, uh, especially if uh, countries or uh, organizations want to use this to self-assess where they stand in terms of supply chain information systems. And then uh, the next tab shows the hierarchy of uh, the different supply chain functions and technological functions that I just spoke about. Uh, and then we have a dashboard based on the assessment that you do, it automatically um, assesses where at across these different functions, supply chain functions, as well as the technical functions, where that particular organization or supply chain uh, for which the assessment was made stands. So let's look at some of the capabilities as an example. So across all these various capabilities, what we did was we defined four different supply chain uh, maturity levels or supply chain information system maturity levels. And uh, we identified the benefits that an organization would derive if they are at a particular level. The very basic level is to have some processes in place and being able to capture uh, data related to those processes at least manually. For example, if you're talking about order management system, being able to capture requisitions that you get from uh, your downstream uh, supply chain levels, uh, it may not be an automated way of capturing, but at least capturing it in a, in a manual way so that the data is available was the very, very basic requirement. But as you graduate through different levels of supply chain, uh, we move more and more towards automating those processes. So we define these uh, sub-functionalities and within those we captured various processes. And as I said before, uh, Joe and myself, we looked at the different industry best practice available frameworks to come up with some of these uh, processes. Uh, and we also have been, um, updating these 
based on our experience of using this tool in countries like Nepal and uh, Rwanda. And in addition to these capabilities, what we did was we identified some of the prerequisites. So for each level, if somebody needs to do, let's say, processes related to level two, what does it take for them to do that? What are, the, some, what are some of the things that should be in place for them to even start looking at um, going from one level to another? And uh, down below, you can see that down below, you can see that, sorry. Uh, we also identified uh, some of the common KPIs that are, that are applicable across these different supply chain functions. Uh, again, this is so that uh, when a country or an organization starts looking at different uh, supply chain information system areas, they can baseline where they stand today. And as they plan to move from one level to another, as they plan to make improvements to their information systems, they can keep track of where they were when they started working on that. And then as they move to the next level, they can see what is the improvement that uh, they gained. So this helps in uh, them tracking some of these uh, key performance indicators. And they can also uh, combine this across different supply chain levels. So they can see this at a central medical store level versus a regional or a provincial medical store level versus health facilities. So that's something that they can use, uh, do using these uh, tool. So similarly, we did this across all the different supply chain functions like procurement, um, supplier and contract management, forecasting and planning. So users who want to assess their different systems and see where they stand, all they have to do is um, open this tool and read through some of these uh, sub functionalities um, and the processes within those. And they can answer uh, whether it is already available in their system or if it is not, or in cases where they have already gone ahead to the next level, they can mark it as uh, not, not applicable. So based on their input, the tool then derives where they stand across these different uh, functionalities of supply chain information systems. And it also within each level identifies where they stand. So that is, that's the tool that we have. Uh, one of the challenges we've had is how we can apply this tool across uh, different supply chain levels. Um, the way we've done across uh, a couple of countries that we've used this is we've looked at it from a national level and uh, the different systems at a national or a central medical store level that that country might have and assisted that way. Uh, but that being said, you can always apply and use this tool to assess different supply chain levels individually as well. So once an assessment using this tool is done, and once the country or the organization understands where they stand, based on their priorities, they can then determine uh, what particular functionality they want to address. If planning is something that they're really suffering with, or if it's master data management that they're suffering with, then they can identify how they want to improve that. And uh, we came up with a template, which I'll show a little bit later, that helps them define a roadmap to achieving that. So our idea was that this tool can be used by field office teams within the countries, uh, procurement agencies that operate within these countries, uh, or other donor organizations or system implementation partners, uh, or even country supply chain uh, leadership teams within ministries of health or uh, USAID mission. Um, and uh, this tool can not only be used for uh, doing a rapid assessment of where they stand in terms of supply chain information systems, but it could also be uh, used for some of the requirements, defining the requirements for uh, events like uh, request for proposal or request for information when they are looking at new systems for these uh, supply chain areas. At the same time, as I said, this tool can become an input 
to developing roadmaps to implementing supply chain information systems. So as I was telling about the roadmap, so we have a template. This template was used uh, for NEPA. Um, the idea was that once a country or an organization does the assessment uh, and they understand at what level across these various supply chain uh, functionalities they stand today, they can define based on their priorities where they want to get to. And, uh, and they can approach this in a phased way. Here we have identified it across five different phases, but again, depending on the country's appetite and country's uh, priorities, they can determine whether they want to do it in multiple quarters, multiple months, or uh, multiple years. And again, they can choose to do a particular set of uh, supply chain functions versus all the various functions that we have identified in the model. And, and again, at the bottom, we can see that we have looked at, uh, we have kind of uh, built into the template the, the various supply chain levels a country might have, and whether in a particular phase, what to what extent they want to approach all these different uh, supply chain functions to be implemented across these uh, supply chain models. So that's about the model. We will be happy to uh, share the model and um, we'll be happy to take any feedback that you have regarding the model or even questions you may have. Um, but next, my colleague uh, Joe will be uh, talking about the Nepal example. Let me share my screen with him. Joe, over to you, Joe. Thank you, Faru. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending this session. Um, that was uh, a, a very good introduction to the maturity model from Swarup. And so I wanna share a little bit about how we actually deployed this. I'm gonna use uh, Nepal, as the example, we've, uh, as uh, Swaru mentioned, we've, we've also deployed this at uh, Rwanda and, and at Pakistan. Um, and each of those, you know, uh, as Swaru mentioned, uh, taught us a little bit about the maturity model and, and helped us add more, uh, refine the capabilities that are there, uh, line them up, um, and make sure that they're applying properly um, to countries as we do the assessment. Um, and in Nepal, we had, uh, let's see if I can move my screen. Yeah. In Nepal, we had the, the benefit of, of uh, uh, tailoring this to an, the, an, an ELMIS implementation initiative that was ongoing in the country that started in 2017. Um, they went live on the product institution in uh, 2018. And around the time that we completed kind of the, the fit gap of their requirements um, uh, for a new system against the new product, we were able to look at the capabilities that that new product was bringing to the country. So we weren't evaluating necessarily what they, what, where they were in 2017. We were evaluating where they would be after the deployment of this system um, and, and that gave us kind of also the ability to look at features that the system had that they weren't planning to deploy right away, but that they could grow into over time. Um, and it also gave us the ability to see uh, capabilities in the model that that new system did not have and, and where we would, um, you know, beg or advise our software uh, provider to make investments in their product uh, in the future. Uh, and so we, we laid out those planned future capabilities based on a maturity model that we built in 2017-18 and then assembled a, a roadmap of capabilities that they would be targeting into the future. So just a little bit about Nepal. Um, Nepal was uh, coming from a place of an existing ELMIS system um, that was really 
tracking their central medical stores and their regional or now provincial medical stores down to their districts. And then they had a recording solution for health posts. Um, so they were trying to capture in near real time transactions at those warehouse functions down to the district level. And really, it wasn't a fully integrated system, and it wasn't doing certain things like uh, batch management, first expiry, first out. Um, and, and, uh, and again, at the health post, it was reporting only, and so that was data that was entered quarterly into the system, uh, and usually available about mid the following quarter, maybe as late as, as you know, three months after, after the end of the quarter. And so the new model that, that we were, the, the new system that, that, that we were moving to uh, was a, a web-based system, fully integrated, uh, cloud-based, and had uh, capabilities to move from uh, track inventory from central medical stores all the way down to the health post. And so the health post has a solution, based solution. And that's only been deployed uh, really in a, in a proof of concept or maybe a pilot, you would say. We have, I think, uh, 20 or 25 health posts that are using a mobile solution. But so now we have um, information that starts at central medical stores. Uh, we move inventory throughout the supply chain. And they even, even in the middle of this, added a layer of the supply chain through uh, their, their devolution um, of where they where they had i think 70 you know uh they had uh, five region uh, the, the cent two central medical stores the five regional stores 77 districts they added underneath that um 753 local level governments llgs which are each responsible for about seven to ten health posts and so they're you know somewhere in the neighborhood of uh four thousand 4,100 health posts underneath that. And so with the, with the mobile capability, we now had health posts that were able to receive uh, inventory on their, on their mobile device and report consumption and report inventory adjustments um, all in near real time. And so some health posts were doing it, you know, uh, weekly, some of them, many of them were just doing it daily. And so we had this built we have visibility all the way down to the health post, but still, you know, as I said, that's a that's a, a, a pilot program, and that will be rolled out later after we get all of those LLGs done. Um, and so there's still a reporting model, um, a quarterly reporting model underneath that, but we uh, now have visibility all the way down to that LLG and to the health post as they start to deploy the mobile solution. So. Um, what we did, we uh, in, in in evaluating the Paul, as I said, we were using the ELMIS system um, as the model for what their what their capabilities would be, um, and we looked at their current capabilities pre LMIS uh, to understand how they would deploy the capabilities that were introduced into the new system. And so, not only their requirements. Um, for for uh, buying that system and for implementing that system, um, but we also looked at capabilities that the system had that that maybe weren't in their requirements and deployed some of those capabilities. Um, and then you know there were there were gaps, uh, and uh, and certainly a lot of those gaps have been have been closed uh, through through some additional implement, implementation. But we had to make some adjustments, adjustments based upon uh, what the gap yeah, could be accomplished. So, you know, off to the right, we're looking at the maturity model. And we can see that, uh, you know, that uh, the system has the capability, it has this capability in yellow, it has this capability, and those are target capabilities that we're going to implement in the system. And, you know, one, one person asked, uh, about the mo model when I was showing it to them once. Well, why why are there why are there capabilities in level one and level two? And if you went out to the right, there are capabilities in level three that are being deployed when you haven't completed everything in level one. Well, <clears throat> level one capabilities are 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 basically this is the the rock bottom. Okay.
okay, this is a starting point. And you may already be past some of those starting points or you may still be operating at some of those starting points, but in other areas, you're operating beyond the level one capability. And so this isn't a, you know, accomplish everything at level one first and then accomplish everything at level two. In many areas, and I'll, and I'll say that, you know, uh, warehouse management um, functionality, for example, is already fairly mature in the country. And so when we start to deploy a new system, we're deploying it kind of more out to the right, right? Where we have things that they're already able to do, things that the system is already able to do. And so we just start tracking, but there may still be things at level two that we need to accomplish. There may be things at level three that we need to accomplish. But so this is just mapping out <clears throat> what, their, what their systems capability was to, um, uh, to, to levels in the maturity model. Then from that, we look, this is kind of a map um, that says, well, what should we be trying to accomplish, right? So if everything on the left in this picture is what we can do today, right? So today, you know, one of the, one of the big sections of forecasting and planning is accumulate demand history. Okay, well, we do that well, we do that today and, and we can develop a baseline forecast. Um, but what might be a target capability is to accumulate that demand history uh, in a more refined way um, and to accomplish some next level features of demand history accumulation. And we could have some blue sky targets. These are things that we really want to be able to do, but we'll keep them on our horizon. Um, that's kind of our stretch goals if we could achieve some of those things. So developing a baseline forecast, we can do that today, um, but a stretch goal might be to have a formalized demand planning system that brings in, you know, a weekly or monthly bucketed demand history and produces uh, a statistical forecast um, that is a rolling forecast produced every month for 12 months out, right? That, that might be a stretch goal. Um, today, in their in their system, they don't have the ability to measure forecast accuracy. So we have a forecast, right? And then we have an actual. And the difference between those is how good your forecast was, right? And it's one of the most key drivers in supply chain. It's, you know, forecast isn't about how good it is. It's about how bad it is. And when you know how bad the forecast is, you can make adjustments in your supply chain um, to accommodate that forecast error. And so we thought achieving a measure of forecast accuracy would be a target capability that we wanted. Um, and then, you know, on, on through supply planning, we did the same things. We can accumulate supply and demand orders and we can create an unconstrained plan, but a stretch goal out into the future might be to do some constraint-based planning or might be to do uh, some, again, some rolling 12-month supply plans that look at the, uh, at the ins and outs of inventory and tell you when you should be taking action in the future rather than responding to a min or a max violation. Um, <clears throat> and I should say, too, that, that, that everything that moves off to the left in our plan starts to, starts to move to the, the, the supply chain information system uh, 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 maturity level that Swarup and I are familiar with, um, where we have, you know, we have uh, fully integrated planning systems with fully integrated order management systems and fully integrated procurement systems so that we're driving, uh, we're driving forecast to supply plan to purchase order. Um, and even to distribution so that we're moving inventory across the supply chain in a coordinated fashion. So we're out, we're out to the left with our current capabilities. We're in the center with, what we're, with where we think we need to go next. Um, and we're off to the right with what we think should be achievable blue sky capabilities um, in our current system or, you know, might, might require some investment to get there. And, and of course, you have to reassess your future capabilities for based on your capacity and service already. Uh, so we added future capabilities roadmap uh, first based 
found the existing capabilities not yet deployed. So as I said, we were evaluating what they have today um, in terms of their software system capabilities. And then we said, but there's there's more functionality in that system that we're not yet deployed. And so there may be some things out there that we need that we, that we haven't yet deployed. So in our first implementation that involved, uh, that, was, that was centered on two provinces where we accomplished all the central medical store implementation, uh, two of the five regional now provincial medical stores, and I think 22 districts and, uh, of the 77, and, uh, and later added these four uh, local, local governments, governments and the health posts underneath them. Um, that would be the rollout of that system to include all provincial stores, all of the districts, and then start to uh, educate all of the LGs and the health posts. Hey Joe, um, we're having yeah. a we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Could you? Okay, is that better? Uh, yeah, that's better. Thank you. Sorry. The uh, added capabilities that we looked at were uh, things that we would accomplish in the next rollout or, or the, the, the further, furthering the rollout of the system. And so well, while we while we completed the implementation in those, you know, uh, regional stores and Joe, you're you're places. still you you're sort of coming in and out. Okay. Um, Boy, I'm sorry. That might be my my internet. Um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll just try and be very clear. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so right now you sound okay. <laughs> okay. So, so as we as we move through the implementation, we started to add additional capabilities that were on the roadmap that would be targeted for the next uh, the, the next rollout um, of the solution. So we would uh, basically add those capabilities um, that we wanted to deploy in the next evolution of the, of the infusion rollout. Um, and and we, we also targeted capabilities that would be blue sky or something in the future. So the, the Nepal roadmap um, has uh, very, very similar to uh, what what uh, was showing um, has the capabilities in the middle, right? Uh, all of these capabilities that are, you know, forecasting and planning and supplier and contract management and procurement system um, across the GI uh, uh, achieved over time those things that we wanted to achieve over time across the top uh, with the geography of that deployment across the bottom. So that, so that we would accomplish all of these things in all of the central medical stores in 2018. Um, we would accomplish all of these things across the provincial warehouses uh, at level two. Uh, we would accomplish all of these things at level two in half of the districts uh, and, uh, and, and municipality stores. Uh, Going like that exactly, I, I, I can tell you it's, it's always a slow and go. But this is the rule map that we laid out. Okay, and I, I did want to switch over to um, the, the Nepal uh, completed uh, assessment, where we're showing where we're showing how we finished the 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 roadmap exercise or how we finished the maturity model exercise um, with these things at level four um, that are not accomplished these things at level three that are not accomplished these things at level two that are not accomplished um, and so we see that the system has some particular strength across things like interoperability uh, it had some strength across things like data management uh, but there are more things that we need to accomplish in order to complete that that uh, ultimate vision of of uh, of the supply chain infor 
information system. So you, you can see off to the left here where interoperability was tight, is very good with this system. They have uh, some track and trace capability, but those are not deployed. Um, we have zero transportation management. Um, you know, we have we have a fairly uh, good order management capabilities, but there are more things that we can accomplish in the warehousing, in procurement, and in supplier and contract management, in forecasting and planning, and uh, somewhat in master data management. <clears throat> So, so the keys to assembling the roadmap, <clears throat> we, we first look at prerequisite capabilities in the physical supply chain that needed to be met uh, in order to consider many of the system capabilities. So for example, managing inventory using a FIFO model is prerequisite to the system's batch management functions. What we found going into that implementation was that the FIFO model, which is kind of dictated by the system, was not possible at many of the locations because of space constraints, because of poor warehouse layout. Um, and we needed some system strengthening, not just from a systems perspective, but from a physical uh, where physical supply chain management perspective so that we could get those those locations on board with the ability to manage uh, first expiry first out. So we had to actually do some things to the software to uh, enable those facilities that couldn't support these recommendations to allow them to not operate at FIFO until we could get in there to do some uh, warehouse relaying out. We, we went out and cleaned a bunch of warehouses and we uh, we redesigned some some uh, some uh, facility layouts um, and and all of that started to add to their ability to actually meet the capabilities that we were seeking so it, we also had to analyze multiple systems um, not just their not just the the intuition system uh, but uh, other systems that they're using uh, across the network um, and, and some of those systems are to be replaced. Um, but as well, we looked at things like how they're uh, potentially uh, integrated to DHIS in the future. And then, and then later, later phases would include the stretch goals that might require some new technology investments. So for example, if we think of uh, forecasting and planning as something that most of these systems have limited capability around, we might look to some things like control tower uh, capabilities, more advanced planning features that could be available in other systems if we want to get into those um, into those capabilities. And then, you know, the, the, the idea of the roadmap is that you frequently reassess. This is a tool that you should be able to use in your, in your, uh, in your annual work plan uh, to describe um, what should we be targeting based upon where we are today and the improvements that we're seeking in the supply chain, what capabilities should we be targeting, whether we have to you know, build them or buy them or, or implement something that we already have, um, frequently reassess those targets based upon what you're accomplishing today um, and, and where you want to drive that supply chain in the future. So that is uh, uh, an, an example of how we deployed the model at Nepal. And uh, the results that we got from it are are really a, a, a good roadmap that describes things that we will be trying to accomplish in the near future and in the far future um, that, that drives our, our uh, uh, continuous improvement programs. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe and Swaroop. Um, that was that was great. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here, but certainly uh, please keep them coming. Uh, you can type them into the questions box uh, on the right hand side um, uh, in the little uh, dashboard that you have. So uh, first question is more of a comment, but um, it says, thank you very much for this presentation. Just confirmed that I agree to take 
uh, that I agree to take into account the holistic approach to organize and operate the supply chain. But my concern is at the operational level, uh, parentheses last mile, where infrastructure and resources are almost non-existent. So I think uh, this person is asking, could you maybe go a little bit more into, you know, how do you accommodate um, or account for the the challenges, particularly at the last mile when you're um, applying this model? Sure. So, so as, as the example I was driving to in Nepal, where they're really on a quarterly reporting basis for all of their health posts, it means we're operating with data that's, you know, five to six months old, um, and we're trying to make good supply chain decisions from it. And so this is not an uncommon problem in healthcare, even in the US where we don't have, in, the, in recent years, haven't had good access. And when I say it's not six month old data, but haven't had good access to consumption data in the supply chain systems, um, people sought uh, uh, solutions that allowed you to, to accumulate that data as inexpensively and as in, in, uh, unintrusively as possible. Um, and so when we look at solutions like that mobility solution um, that, that provides for limited um, uh, network access, we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, 3GL network capabilities or even less um, so that people can, so that the health posts can receive and report consumption and make inventory adjustments. That's the types of, those are the types of solutions that we need to be seeking in order to get more real-time data. The goal is always to get more real-time data in low resource and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, in, in low resource environments. And so we're, we need to look for simple tools um, that anyone can use with limited connectivity that allows them to bring data in, you know, at least weekly so that we can, so that we can start to understand where the supply chain has needs. Yeah, th th thanks, Joe. Just to add on to that, uh, as, an, as an example, we've seen in uh, Rwanda that the health community workers use, uh, similar to what Joe said, a mobile device to report on uh, some of the consumption related aspects even even in terms of what uh, stock of co uh, pharmaceutical commodities that they hold um, today it happens more on a reporting basis and uh, yes it's more to do with connectivity and issues like that but we have come a long way from when mobile phones weren't existing and and even the networks were quite bad and it's evolving so hopefully we'll get to a point where you know it's it's much better but we have seen countries um, taking away to approaches to uh, moving to a point where even last mile consumption is recorded in, in near to real time and again having this model and having a holistic approach doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we get there tomorrow as i said it's an evolving process so uh, every step in that direction that we take would be beneficial to us. Uh, thanks. So the next question here, um, on the radar map, are capabilities that are present across levels averaged and represented? Uh, I don't know if I understood that correct, but uh, the way we have represented is um, there are there are two uh, graphs there. One is within each functionality we have identified where that uh, country or, or an organization that is being assessed stands. And the way we've done it is we've looked at all the different uh, capabilities in the, the first uh, 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 graph and uh, kind of uh, seen where in terms of, so all the different capabilities within let's say warehouse management and the number of capabilities that the countries meet. Uh, so it, you could say it's an averaged approach in the first uh, uh, graph, 
but in the second graph it's within each level where that country stands is kind of a breakdown of that uh, graph further does that answer the question uh thanks we'll we'll see if uh we'll get a follow-up question if you haven't answered it how about that uh so i've got another question here um did you take into account any additional maturity models when developing uh this one yeah we did see a few uh, other models um uh, we saw we saw a couple of them which were more to do with the supply chain processes rather than the supply chain information systems. So our focus was more on information systems uh, and not uh, focused on supply chain processes itself. Of course, processes and systems go hand in hand, but our focus was more on how these in information systems address those supply chain functions. We didn't find anything that was catering to the information system aspect, we found a lot of models that uh, dealt with the supply chain processes itself. Joe, anything you want to add, Joe? Yeah, and, and we also saw some that, that looked at the human resource capability um, and, and the, the skill level of the workers who are using the supply chain. Uh, and we really wanted to focus mostly on what the system should be able to do. Now, when we deployed uh, the model at Pakistan, Pakistan's systems are uh, very strong systems that they built in house, but they hadn't been fully deployed. And so they really wanted to get a picture of the capability that they have that might have only been deployed at central medical stores and partially at their at their provincial stores um, and not at all at their district stores. And so we actually, um, in, in, the, in the process, added, added a column that says, yes, it, the system has this capability, but it's only N percent deployed through the supply chain so that they could see now specific, and, and that's true, it's, it's also the bottom of the roadmap that we show, but they wanted to actually answer those questions that says, yes, we have this capability, but we haven't deployed it throughout the supply chain. And so that kind of starts to give us an average, if you will, of, of uh, where, where, they, where they have a specific capability. Yes, they have it, but they haven't fully deployed it. Okay, um, and then this is kind of a two-part part, follow-up. Like, how do you see your model interacting with these other maturity models that, you know, go beyond information systems? Um, and could they potentially be um, complementary, for example? Yeah, sure, definitely. Because uh, when we looked at a couple of other models, we looked at uh, some that dealt with supply chain processes itself. Uh, so we did look at uh, some of those models and made sure that we that the model that we were developing kind of covered all the supply chain functions. And that's why uh, in, in the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that we didn't want to reinvent the wheel in terms of processes. We wanted to look at what we already have and make it contextual to our uh, um, public health supply chain. Uh, so we we have definitely looked at them and we'll continue to consider anything that we come across in the future and align with those uh, models. And if there are anything that you know of particularly, and if you want to point us to that, uh, we would be happy to take a look at that. And, and we want this to be more and more useful to countries and organizations that work in countries and uh, relatable so that they can based on this tool, they can come up with improvement opportunities and something that can be tangible for countries. Thanks. Um, so uh, given the list of intended users, um, how will you ensure that this model can be used by each intended user to get similar results in the same country? Because you know, each user may understand the capabilities differently. It's a good question. Typically what we do and then the way, uh, and Joe can add here, uh, at least in Rwanda, what, we've what we did was uh, 
we didn't want this to be individually done by different organizations or different entities or individuals within those organizations. Uh, we had a um, workshop or a, or a, a presentation where we uh, introduced this tool, but then we sat with people uh, to go through this assessment. Uh, we did this initially with these couple of countries because we were ourselves evaluating how this tool helps countries and how this tool can be used within those countries. But in the future, we would expect people within the country um, can take this tool and go to different stakeholders and run this tool instead of you know giving off to different organizations and those different organizations using those tools by themselves. So I, I would see this as a tool that uh, uh, individuals would work across different organizations to uh, take the benefit of. I, I think too, um, Swarup, that, that every time we've used it, 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 it uh, started with a bit of education. Um, so making sure that they understand the capabilities that the system is driving to um uh, you know as as the question said they can be interpreted in different ways um we're, we're when when we wrote it <laughs> and when we put the capabilities down we tried to be as specific as possible about what that meant um and so there some of them are are, are a, a bit wordy but they're they they do try to describe what the system should be able to do but still some of that in some of these areas uh, from our experience will will require a, a, a little bit of education and so i could imagine that if a country wants to implement this tool um, that they might want to get some advice on uh, or have some questions answered about some of the specific uh, capabilities that are that are driven to in the tool but we tried to take each one looking at it as a holistic process that said you know, if, if you didn't have strong capabilities in this area, you're at level one, but you should be able to see the progression out to level four, where we're talking about, you know, uh, how the system interacts with data, how the system uh, interacts with integration. So, you know, at level one in a warehouse, we might be talking about getting advice on a shipment from a supplier um, and entering that into the system. And out at level four, we'd be talking about advanced ship notices directly integrated into your supply chain warehouse management system so that you see incoming supply. So when you look at it kind of across the spectrum, uh, you'll, you'll see that we're driving to an integrated uh, system. And But I could still see where, where anybody that wants to deploy this might, might want to get some advice or have some questions answered. We'd be happy to do that. Yeah, and, and the other thing we've been doing, Joe and myself, uh, and even from uh, folks like Parambir uh, who, who have used this is to take input and uh, uh, any such uh, ambiguities that we come across, especially when people are interpreting it in different ways, we've tried to update uh, what we have in terms of processes and sub-functions within the maturity model and make it more relevant to the countries. So then, and we'll continue to do that as this model evolves. Uh, great, so uh, next question is, can the maturity model be used to select or rank software providers? Yes, that is what we uh, had as one of the other objectives or our uses of this tool that you could look at the different uh, functionalities within each area like within auto management or within planning and if you're selecting a tool specific to that uh, you can consider what level of uh, maturity that your software or system should be at and use this as a base to build those requirements for those tools definitely definitely uh, and then is your hope to uh, also inform investment decisions Um, at a at a high level, yes, and and the way we uh, see that happening is as Joe showed, and uh, I was showing the template. 
based on the assessment, a country or an organization that's doing this can determine where they want to be down the line, let's say one year down the line or two years down the line. And based on those priorities and based on the capabilities that they determine uh, as a result of this assessment, they can prioritize and, and that would help them determine how, what kind of investment they would need. So that's how this would help in that. It may not be a direct input per se. I've also used it to give to our software vendor. I gave it to our software vendor and said, boy, this is where your pro product ought to be in about five years. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, next question, has supporting documentation been created? Yes, we do have a Word document that uh, goes along with this. Uh, unfortunately, because Joe and myself, we also have other day jobs to do. We haven't been diligent in keeping it up to date. Um, one of the uh, to-dos that we have on our list to, is to in, in, as you re remember, in the first time I had something called as an instructions, uh, we make it. We plan to make it a little bit more uh, uh, intuitive so that people can take that and be able to use it by themselves. Uh, we also have a Word document that is more elaborate uh, and talks not only about the instructions but also about how the tool is and how it can be used in the various uh, different things about the different functionalities. All right, great. So um, those are all the questions that I'm seeing. So uh, I just wanted to thank both Joe and Swarup and um, and PSM for um, for presenting this model. I think it's a, a interesting idea, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you know broader dissemination and utilization of it and uh, and I'm also uh, just wanted to thank everyone for joining us and as I said at the beginning this will be this part of the launch of our visibility and analytics work stream and so uh, so if you want to stay involved keep hearing about you know the latest work from uh, different organizations um, and to, and to uh, find some collaborative work for us as well um, we'll be um, uh, we'll be emailing you shortly on the SSWG list. So uh, thanks again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.